morning, it's still morning. Um, I um, first would like to thank the AMDA and IPA for inviting me to this, uh, in my, my opinion, fascinating meeting in which we directly communicate our scientific resu results to the patients. Um, what I will discuss is uh, the development of, uh, of uh, gene therapies through the hematopoietic system, uh, through the blood cell system, um, where we use, uh, in fact, uh, blood cells as a factory for acid alpha-glucosidase. And I will start with, uh, with describing very briefly the context of uh, our type of work. Um, as uh, many of you will know, uh, currently we have 7,000 inherited diseases recognized in humans, and they are increasing. And in about one third, the genetic defect has been identified. For the majority of those diseases, there is no really uh, a cure available. Uh, and the approaches, the medical approaches that we have are prenatal diagnosis and genetic counseling, which has been very effective, for instance, in the red blood cell disorder, thalassemia. Symptomatic therapy for the majority of, uh, of the diseases. Replacement therapy for a few, including uh, pompous disease. And eventually, uh, if we know the genetic defect, we can contemplate of, um, we can contemplate developing a gene therapy that is correcting the uh, defect directly in the cells of the patients. Here are uh, a few examples uh, in which we, um, uh, here are a few well-known examples, hemophilia, Duchenne's dystrophy, sickle cell anemia, thalassemia, and uh, we have focused on uh, inherited, let me see, on inherited, this doesn't work, on inherited immune deficiencies, uh, you have a curtain for it, thank you very much, okay. inherited immune deficiencies, and on storage disorders such as MPS1, Hurler, and especially Pompe disease. We are not doing that on our own. Uh, about 12 years ago, we um, uh, started um, uh, uh, developing a, a European consortium that combines all the leading centers on gene therapy for inherited disorders in Europe, from Sweden till Spain, and from the United Kingdom till Greece, and nowadays also Turkey. And uh, we felt that that was the only way to develop for those rare diseases. In many cases, we don't have more than 10 patients per year in all over Europe. But this was the only way to develop it effectively. And uh, the type of technology that we have developed is based on uh, a well-known therapy, bone marrow transplantation, which is uh, currently used for 15,000 patients a year worldwide for diseases such as leukemia and other blood cell disorders. Very briefly, um, your uh, blood cells live very shortly, and uh, uh, a human, as you're sitting here, daily produces uh, about 100 grams of uh, new blood cells. That's a very large amount that uh, comes down to one to five million cells per second. Um, we have learned uh, already 40 years ago that it's possible to take 1% of the bone marrow of an individual, isolate the stem cells, and uh, infuse them back, for instance, uh, if a patient has cancer and uh, receives chemotherapy, and then within three weeks you have an entirely new hematopoietic system, blood cell forming system, from that 1% of bone marrow. And this technology has been used also to genetically modify the stem cells. And as Arnold Reuser has already explained to you, uh, we do so with, by using a vehicle, a viral vector, in which the disease properties of the virus have been removed and replaced by a therapeutic gene. We call those, uh, those, those viruses viral vectors, and uh, also it took us 25 years. Nowadays we can very efficiently uh, genetically modify hematopoietic stem cells by a simple overnight transduction in which we, uh, a simple overnight incubation by which we uh, combine uh, in one vessel the viruses and the stem cells. Stem cells, when we reinfuse them to the patient, find 
uh, that's a property of stem cells, find uh, their way to the bone marrow very efficiently, efficiency, uh, is a efficiency, uh, an efficiency that has been estimated at about 60 to 100 percent, and start making new blood cells. Well, this, has been, uh, this approach has been tried for inherited diseases in which bone marrow transplantation was a cure, but not very effective because of lack of suitable donors. Uh, this explains the vector again. We originally used mouse leukemia viruses, which had, had certain drawbacks, and now we use the AIDS virus that has been made replication defective, so it cannot replicate. It has been self-inactivating, so after it has done its job, uh, almost nothing of the virus remains, and uh, the disease genes have been replaced by therapeutic genes that we can use uh, for different diseases. Uh, this technology, this approach, has first been used for uh, immune deficiencies in Europe, pioneered in London and in Paris. And um, the, uh, the, this, is, this is the type of diseases that you all know as the bubble boy, especially in San Antonio. And um, what you can see that uh, until now, I will not enter too many details, until now 46 patients have been successfully treated of which 44 have survived. One uh, died from leukemia, I will not enter that today, and the other, uh, the procedure failed because of a concomitant infection in the patient. If we compare that with the best available treatment by donor bone marrow transplantation, then those patients had only a chance of surviving of 25 for this disease and 50% uh, for uh, the other. So this is very successful and also demonstrates that despite some complications, uh, this approach essentially is safe and uh, also life-saving for otherwise lethal diseases. I'm coming now to uh, gene therapy by this technology uh, for POMPA disease. Uh, this is uh, all you know, this, has, this, is, this is what you know very well. Current therapy is uh, myosin treat treatment and the uh, advantages and benefits to the patients, which are great, have been discussed uh, uh, over the past uh, day, but also the, the drawbacks and limitations have been discussed in lengthy detail. Uh, we have used the Pompe Mars model that was developed by Arnold Reuser and his colleagues uh, to do exactly the same as, uh, as has been done in the uh, in the clinical trials for the bubble boy diseases uh, in mice. Um, so we isolate bone marrow from, in this case, male uh, donors, which are male pompe uh, mice, if you wish, isolate the hematopoietic stem cells, do the overnight genetic modification procedure, and then we infuse them back and make some space in the bone marrow by irradiating the female recipient mice. In this way, we can also uh, see how many of the original cells uh, have been successfully gene modified uh, because there is a sex difference between the two types of cells. Uh, and the idea, of course, is to use blood cells uh, that you produce daily at a very high rate, also as a factory for alpha glucosidase. And then uh, as has been discussed also earlier, uh, the enzyme can be taken up from the circulation by the mannose 6 phosphate receptor. Um, we have published last year that essentially this method is, uh, is very effective. Uh, we left 70% of the blood cell producing system of the mice intact, it was their own, and only 30% of, uh, of the bone marrow and the blood cells express the alpha glucosidase in the approach that we have chosen which resulted in a very high level of production of alpha glucosidase, which was sustained over the lifetime of the mice. It restored the alpha glucosidase activity in tissues. It gave a full correction in liver and spleen. It gave a full correction of the heart uh, uh, storage. It significantly improved respiration. It improved, but not normalized. And there it also resembled the myosin therapy. Uh, skeletal muscle function, and, and that is very special, and I will enter that in detail, it resulted in a robust immune tolerance to the recombinant transient product, which means that it is impossible by this method that the uh, uh, foreign gene, and we used the human alpha glucosidase in those, those mice, that the foreign gene will evoke an antibody response. 
these are the heart data. You're looking at an echography. This is the uh, ventricular wall of the normal mice. This is the heart beating. Uh, this is the uh, pompe mouse. Hmm? You have a movie or not? No, 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 no movie. Um, and you can see that the uh, wall is, as you've seen before, is thickened by glycogen storage, and that the heart rate is much slower than a normal mouse. And this is the gene therapy mouse, and you see that it's virtually indistinguishable from the heart of the normal mouse. I will enter, because that has been a point of much discussion also in this meeting, the antibody, the, the tolerance induction. It is well known uh, from allogeneic bone marrow transplantation, so donor, donor bone marrow transplantation, and it has been demonstrated in a few uh, examples in, in humans as well, that um, if you have a successful bone marrow from a donor, uh, that you can, in, can come in with any other organ of the same donor, and it will never be rejected. And the reason is that the blood cell forming system is also responsible for the immune recognition between foreign and self. Uh, we tested this in this particular situation by two immunizations. A first immunization by a method that is forbidden in the Netherlands, uh, that is using uh, 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 tuberculosis, uh, um, tuberculosis antigens as, a, as, a, as, as an adjuvant, which gives a very vigorous immune response. Two, two weeks later, came back with a second immunization and then um, measured uh, the immune responses. Uh, here you see the baseline data, no antibodies uh, to start with. These are the mice that have been treated. These are the control <laughs> knockout mice, and uh, these are the wild type, wild type mice. Um, after the first immunization, you see that the wild type mice have only a very small response by the very simple reason, for the very simple reason that uh, they make the mouse glucosidase, which is only slightly different from the human one. But the knockout mouse, of course, has a, a vigorous response, but the gene therapy treated mouse has no response whatsoever. And then we gave the second boost, and or the, the boost, and then uh, you can see here that also the wild type mouse has a vigorous response, uh, which is uh, almost, is, is very close to that of the uh, control uh, uh, pompe mouse, but that, again, the gene therapy treated mouse does not respond whatsoever. I started already for my talk with minus 20 minutes. No, so. no, no, I take the time, so 15 is 15. <laughs> um, so, we were not entirely satisfied with these results, especially because the, um, especially because the results in the uh, muscles were uh, the results in the muscles were uh, essentially very limited so we played around uh, in optimizing this protocol by fiddling around with the DNA sequence the numbers of cells needed the number of genes per cell and eventually we should need a safety evaluation uh, here you can see that if we fiddled around with the DNA that we constructed a new vector that per gene integrated is approximately producing 15-fold more alpha-glucosidase than the original uh, gene as it exists in our bodies. And when we tested that in, when we tested that in uh, vivo, in the mice, and this is 10 months after the procedure, look at the black bars, this is the uh, glucosidase activity with the new factor, with the new gene, and look at the black bars here, they are absent, which means that also the glycogen is absent in all the muscles that have been tested. Uh, the famous Rotorot experiment, I'm not going to explain it anymore, normalized with the new vector uh, essentially the uh, time the mice could stay on, but we felt that this method can be influenced by the investigator and therefore also designed an investigator independent test by hooking up a um, running wheel to the a running wheel to the cages by which the mice can voluntarily start running if they like. It takes them approximately, let's have a look at the normal mice, the wild type, which are the, the diamonds. Uh, it takes them approximately eight, nine days to see the fun of it. But uh, once, once they have seen the fun of it, they run uh, regularly 10 miles a night. 
Uh, whereas the knockout mice uh, do not make more than, let's say, uh, two miles. And um, if you now look at the mice treated with the stem cells modified by the uh, new, modified with the new vector, you see that they are essentially indistinguishable from the normal mice. And if we sum up, sum up the data over a whole month, 28 days, then you can see that the uh, knockout and the uh, gene therapy, the, sorry, that the wild type and the gene therapy treated mice are indistinguishable. Actually, they run from San Antonio to Dallas, and the, and the pompa mice do not make it further than Austin at best. One of my last slides, um, we also looked in the brain. And to our surprise, uh, this method was also very effective in reducing the, uh, in increasing the enzyme levels in the brain. There is some residual uh, glycogen, especially in the astrocytes, which is, which is physiological. Uh, but if we quantify it over the whole brain here, then we can see that the new factor and the wild type mice are indistinguishable in brain glycogen storage. So we think we can also tackle many of the neurological problems of the infantile form of the disease. This summarizes it. Residual development is um, further optimization in terms of cells needed. We are completing currently the safety analysis. Uh, we do in vitro studies on human pump cells. And uh, we are currently in the process of starting up the factor production under GMP conditions and preparing for a multicenter trial for grim negative patients to start with. Uh, a few words of caution. Um, we expect that the uh, gene therapy treatment of this type is optimally effective early after if applied early after diagnosis. Um, secondly, neonatal screening, so that we know the patients, will increase the efficacy of this type of gene therapy tremendously, as Dr. Chandler yesterday explained for the myozyme therapy. And uh, we also anticipate, but we haven't done the relevant experiments yet or completed those, if applied during progressive disease, we anticipate stabilization rather than cure. Um, as I told you, we are not alone. Uh, we are doing this experiment in these, these we are doing these, this development in the context of a European collaborative um, effort. And currently, with exactly the same uh, technology uh, strategy uh, for adrenolacrodystrophy, uh, a clinical trial has been published already, started in 2008, and currently four patients enrolled. For metachromatic leukodystrophy, a clinical trial has started in Milan. Uh, currently also four patients enrolled, and we hope to learn from those clinical trials uh, in such a way uh, that uh, uh, the uh, clinical trial for POMPA will have a very smooth ride. We anticipate that MPS1 will be the next candidate, so Herder disease will be the next candidate, and POMPA shortly thereafter. Uh, this work has been done uh, particularly by Miro Stock, present in the audience, by Nick Van Til for the vector design and production, uh, by many co-workers within our university uh, for vector development with uh, our colleagues in Milan and in Hanover. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I apologize to all the speakers for having been so rude. <laughs> but I think we managed and it will be done then. Um, we will have a uh, panel discussion, so please. Uh, uh, I got a question. <laughs> I'm ready to go. I just want to thank all you guys for the great presentations. Um, kind of difficult for some of us, I think, to keep up with at times. I did the best I could. My first question is, or, or my only question is for Dr. Corbero. I don't know if I said that right. Probably not. Um, uh, your approach was uh, AAV to liver, right? I mean, that was, uh, it was AAV to liver. And then you were looking at uh, liver expression of GAA, correct? Is that? And then you were adding the clenbuterol after the liver expression. Is that how it went? Simultaneous, and then the clenbuterol treatment is, is ongoing. Okay, so has anyone looked at a similar approach of say ERT plus something like albuterol, something a little bit more direct? 
Yes, we have. Um, that's unpublished data, but we have published the combination of clenbuterol and, and ERT, okay. and that's effective. Okay, thank you. Um, this question is uh, for Dr. Byrne. I, I enjoyed uh, your interesting talk uh, very much. Thank you. Uh, are you able to tell us a little bit more about the um, inspiratory muscle uh, training portion of the study? Like how long it was delivered and the details regarding the intensity of training, the training load, the nature of the uh, intervention? So sure. The training period starts between 30 and 90 days before dosing. That's the screening period. Um, so this is done four days a week, and um, we make progressive increases in the inspiratory load to what's tolerated for roughly 10 repetitions uh, during three bouts of training. So it's very similar to the training regimen that's been used by uh, our collaborators who study this phenomenon in um, mostly the critical care population that has prolonged ventilatory uh, failure or failure to wean patient population. So, um, but I think the, um, the the important thing is that we realize that the diminished phrenic output in this patient population means that their own intrinsic drive is at a very high level already. Um, that they are, uh, this term is called duty cycle, so they're using a high proportion of what they can to drive ventilation. And this, uh, in most cases, unless there's improved output from the system, this is unsustainable. So um, uh, we didn't see an effect uh, and, uh, that was as significant as the post-G transfer effect. In terms um, after the uh, IMST? Correct. Okay, so um, and that's sort of how you separate out the effects is by just uh, testing the IMST after that. Before. Effectively, it's, a, it's like an in, internal crossover trial. Thank you. Um, Dr. Raymond? Um, first question for even two questions for Barry. Um, whether your patients were are cream positive or cream negative. And my second question is more for my own education. What's the contribution of the diaphragma, uh, diaphragma problems to the overall respiratory uh, problems in a patient com as compared to, for example, intercostal muscles. So what can we expect, even right. if you have a 100% success in correction? Sure. Uh, obviously, there are two components. Uh, the nerve alone is not going to do much. Um, but um, while I, you know, we, the conventional wisdom really is the predominant impact in respiratory function is related to the muscle weakness itself. Um, that was the purpose of the experiment where we are directly dosing the lower motor neuron to see what the independent effect is um, in, uh, in respiration. And in fact, when we look at respiration in the model that um, uh, was uh, published by your group um, related to just muscle correction, those mice, uh, even with normal GA activity in the diaphragm during quiet breathing, have the same deficit in respiration as the total knockouts. So in that circumstance, the muscle is not sufficient to improve ventilation at baseline or in response to hypercapnia. And what I think is happening is that as patients lose uh, pump function from the diaphragm, they augment their force vital capacity with the extra diaphragmatic musculature, and this leads to a very altered breathing pattern, one that would normally come into play after you've maximized diaphragm function, so like in, uh, in, in extreme exercise, and that's happening all the time um, using accessory muscles. What about cream positive or cream negative? Uh, the, two, the, the, the first two patients are cream positive, and the third is cream negative. Mm -hmm. And one question for Dwight, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but if, as far as I remember this Angelini, old Angelini paper, which he used beta agonists uh, for uh, of the patients, so the, he had some side effects, okay. negative side effects yeah. in, in, I think that the uh, good result was in one patient or two, I, I don't remember exactly, but there were, I remember that there You're were correct some in, in part, and certainly I've studied that paper. Um, so, actually they enrolled five subjects, four had 
more adult onset Pompe disease and one juvenile onset, but in the latter uh, patient was, was uh, ventilator dependent. And you know, that's, that's another classification, juvenile versus adult, but you understand what I mean. Um, and um, the side effects were somewhat in the ventilator dependent patient and only in the uh, first phase when they did IV albuterol. Then they switched to oral albuterol and all five patients tolerated um, the treatment very well. And actually, the four um, who were ventilator-free uh, had an improved muscle function. So it was a little complicated, and that's a very good question. So Nina, I have actually another thing that might shed some light on your, on your question about the relative contributions of muscle versus the nervous system. So yeah. specifically the diaphragm sure. relative to other muscle groups like intercostal muscles. Exactly. So uh, in one adult patient, we now have experience with direct diaphragm pacing. And um, this is to augment uh, the intrinsic phrenic activity. The phrenic nerve has to be intact for this to work. But um, that also allows us to record the diaphragm EMG and we can look at the mechanical function of the diaphragm in a number of ways, looking at airway pressure and abdominal pressure. And what uh, we know so far, uh, about uh, 40 days after this, uh, training began where only the diaphragm is acti activated during pacing, particularly during sleep, um, that uh, that is enabled this uh, individual to reduce his mechanical ventilatory support and actually at night almost completely now triggering any pressure support ventilation he gets from the diaphragm because the chest wall becomes completely inactive. So um, that gives some insight into how just stimulating or, act or restoring the function of the lower motor neuron impacts overall ventilation. Obviously it's a system that benefits from both aspects, diaphragmatic and extra diaphragmatic breathing. And, and I think, um, you know, as, as was talked about yesterday, there are a significant parts of the extra thoracic airway that are important in this too. So it's a very complex uh, pathway to get effective ventilation, so we think it'll take many different levels of, uh, of, of for this approach to work. Okay. More questions, uh, Dr. Bishani? Is it all? We want short questions, short answers. <laughs> <laughs> This is a question for you, Barry, actually. Um, looking at the 1602 and the 1702 data, I was just curious. Uh, in the seven cases that you saw that who ultimately had ventilatory uh, failure, what proportion of those were the high titer patients or the crim negative patients? Because um, in, in a view of it, it would be explained based on high antibody titers that they would have pulmonary failure. Um, so I just needed some uh, understanding of whether these were any other patients. Yeah, so the initial ones that were vent dependent were those that were enrolled after one year of age and they were all CRIM positive because they were actually part of the 1702 population. Uh, maybe I didn't frame the question correctly. Uh, when you said that the seven who ultimately became ventilator dependent, how many of those were actually CRIM negative and how many of them had developed uh, so high type yes, body type? Well, as you know, all the CRIM negative patients had ultimately had ventilatory failure and or died. So um, that certainly is a contributor. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Right, and that, that's something that we've seen in observation that the low titer patients you know, who started early do not require ventilator support. So not doubting that there is a nervous component to the disease, but it seems to have less of an impact than the ones who've developed the antibody titers. So, but there's also some evidence that, and uh, this is a very small number of patients, but even in some who have, have no antibody titer, who are CRIM negative, who have been blocked from forming antibody, we are aware of one case that has had ventilatory failure despite early ERT and no antibodies. Um, question over there, yes please. Yes, well, uh, Gene therapy is exciting and interesting. 
Um, I'm an old fart. I don't have enough time to wait for that. So I'm going to ask Dwight about your uh, Clumbiro study. What kind of time frame are you looking at on that? Well, first off, I, I hope that you do have time, <laughs> if, if it's appropriate. Um, so um, probably starting in January. So, so we have everything lined up. Um, we're, we're starting the IRB process and uh, obtaining funding now. Great. We had an empty battery here. Yeah, same. Thank you. Um, does uh, gene therapy in general um, depends on the individual genotype? And does this mean uh, perhaps a, a difficulty in a general application? I, and well, I, 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 well I, I can say yes. Uh, so much, I, I think the same lessons are from enzyme therapy. Uh, I think the, the crim negative, crim positive issue is a reflection of your genes. So if you have a mutation that allows you to produce a little bit of the enzyme that may not be mutated or whatever, cause you to have symptoms, you'll be less likely to provoke an immune response when you're exposed to the enzyme or the gene therapy producing the enzyme. Uh, I, so, so those same things. So I'm encouraged though by first we've got maneuvers that you heard about this morning where you could, if someone developed an antibody, we may be able to go in and either you're at risk for it, so we preemptively strike and give you immune suppression, or thereafter you would give immune suppression. Or even today with the, uh, the bone marrow transplant, the potential to tolerate in that manner is certainly another way that gene therapy could address that. And remember, all these things could be combined. And, uh, you know, so, so there, those, those same things will come into play. Uh, a finding that you had an effect within the CNS. Why do you, how, how did it do that? Well, it's a very good question, and we don't know it exactly either. Uh, but we published in 1988 in another lysosomal enzyme deficiency, Krabbe, that the descendants of hematopoietic stem cells replace the microglia if it is damaged. And we uh, guess, uh, and we are in the process of confirming it, we guess that the same mechanism applies here. The other possibility is that the, uh, that the really excessive levels that we can reach it this way uh, leak through the blood brain barrier. That's the other option. So we have to discriminate between those two. But the effect is very clear. Can I want to comment on that? Yes, please. Question. So did, you, did, did the enzyme levels in the blood, I, I don't know if I missed it on the slides, were they, the G, could you detect GAA activity in the blood over this period of time that were excessively elevated over background? Uh, we detected the leukocytes. Uh, in the blood, the half-life time was extremely short. So we didn't make any attempt to uh, measure it in the plasma, but we measured it in the leukocytes. And the leukocytes, I think, are something in the order of uh, 10 to 15 fold higher than with the, uh, with the native gene in the last study. I think, I think it's, it, it goes to the question here about is the enzyme being secreted or is it locally being provided by an adjacent cell? Um, and so, I mean, in our, in our experiments with the liver, we can detect <laughs> vast quantities of GAA in the blood at accelerated, extremely high levels, and that translated into correction. Uh, so uh, I, I wonder about how much fusion is going on, for example. There certainly aren't my, you know, stem cells in the bone marrow that could be fusing with muscle cells. Is there uh, potential for transfer of the enzymes that way as well that could be contributing to the effect? Well, there are very little muscle cells in the bone marrow, but um, uh, it is definitely possible. Also, it, it should be an extremely rare uh, event that uh, a hematopoietic cell fuses with, an, for instance, a mesenchymal stem cell that then uh, mm -hmm. moves to a muscle. But we don't think that we cannot demonstrate any donor type cells in muscles except for blood cells. That is, that is, that's for sure. Thank you. My question is less scientific because I don't understand that stuff. But um, as a late onset female of childbearing ages with the stem cell research, it it has passed through my mind, if I were to have a child, would that child's stem cells ever benefit me? I mean, is that something down the road that may be a possibility, or is it just something I, that I could just put away? I, 
I think I could maybe address that. In, in regard to what we're hearing here, what's unique about the bone marrow transplant has been tried in Pompeii before in the past. Or, but remember, what's going on here is that those stem cells are producing extra high levels of GAA. They've been engineered to do that, whereas your child's stem cells will just produce the normal amount of GAA that we all do. So that's a different question. Alan, if you want to. And if I may very briefly opt to that, your own stem cells are the best for your purposes. Oh, yeah. uh, if there are more questions, please go to the speakers later. Uh, we will now have a break. You can front as possible so we can have a kind of sort of round table discussion so if it's possible for you please as close together as possible in the center in the center if not possible it's okay you will find you okay hi everyone i want to go ahead and introduce uh, us to the patient round table discussion and I know we're not really at a round table, but bear with me. We had to uh, do this kind of quickly and we didn't have time to rearrange the room. So uh, we're going to start off with a brief video. I think most of you know him, but uh, Luke Garrett is a Pompeii patient. He's 18. I've known him since he was probably about two. And um, he just, he really wanted to be here, but just, he couldn't make it in. He wanted to share a little bit of his story and his life. So we're going to go ahead and watch the video, and then Marissa is going to take it from there. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
when I was five months old, and I began enzyme treatment when I was ten years old. The enzyme I'm currently on is myozyme. Okay. Lately, I've been involved in many things, such as going to college and being in a band. The two combined can make my life pretty busy at times, and I try always to have as much fun as possible. My plans for the future include going to college and getting my degrees in psychology and chemistry, although I do plan to continue my path in music. I really do hope to use my degrees in college as only a backup plan, and I hope that one day I can find great success in the music field. A lot of people ask me, what I might say to a newly diagnosed patient. I don't really know. Maybe one thing I'd say is, Pompeii isn't you, nor are you Pompeii. 
You are merely someone who has popping disease. You can do anything you want to in life if you put your mind to it. I think I'm pretty good example of that. He's taking up his life with treatment and wants to become a rock star. So that shows that we all have a life to live and many of us have treatment and that's the reason why we actually got together here to discuss how it will happen in the future, to learn from the scientists and, uh, and the industry what's going on, but at the same time the universe in you. And I want to learn from you and um, what you, how you feel about your treatment, what you do, what you feel now that you can do with it, and how you give shape to your life. Uh, so I want to give you all uh, the chance to discuss it and talk about it and also tell me about positive feelings but it's perhaps also in negative feelings because there's a lot of challenges laying ahead of us. It's not easy. I know it myself. So please go ahead and tell me what you think. Um, is there anyone who's able to... Yeah. Hi, my name is Nora, and I was in the program from the beginning, and you'll be sorry. <laughs> um, I really used to think this is a time that I could just relax and read when I was getting my therapy. Because the rest of the time, I was thinking about how could I keep going? How could I do this? How could I do that? I'm a very stubborn person. And my daughters were always after me. You know, you've got to let us do things. Well, the problem was they tried to do things for me that I could do for myself. So it's really hard to distinguish what can you do for yourself and be independent and what do you have to turn over to your family or friends. But when they offer to do things for you, that you can do, you need to open up your mouth and tell them, you know, and say, hey, I can do this, but come over tonight and do all my dishes. <laughs> you know, then they'll, they won't take offense to it, but you have to do it in a way that they don't get offended because they mean well, but we're a stubborn bunch. I know we are because you wouldn't have taken all this time and energy to come here to this conference if you weren't concerned a better quality of life. So. That speaks to itself. Is there anyone who can contribute to that? Is there anyone Dealing with the same problem that you have to deal with. What can I do myself? And what can't I do myself? All right. Do you have anything? Me? Yeah. Yeah. I guess um, the thing I struggle the most with is how to transition from my life before, if you would, to my life today. Not maybe kind of yours. I like what you're saying. Where. You know, 15 years ago, I could ski and I could do this and that. And I know I can't do that now. And I'm sorry. Um, so how do you, mentally, I guess, how do you, you know, how do I keep going in this new life? And I don't mean that as a negative, but it is, it is different. Um, and how do I learn to do, do things differently and, and you know, um, and not think I'm, being less than I can be, um, you know, how to, it's okay to let somebody cut my lawn or something like that, or 
God forbid the children do it. Um, so that's that's what I'm, that's what I struggle with a lot. And, you know, I wonder. Um, uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm, should you, if the resources out there, you know, should and take advantage of, of more than I do. But I think mentally, I, that's that's an obviously physical too. But that's the thing. I, when I go to sleep at night, that kind of keeps me up. It's just you know, how do I get comfortable in my new my new life? So that means that you every night you rethink about it. What? How do you think you should manage the next day? Yeah, I mean, not every night, but um, um, yeah, kind of. Uh, am I living the way I, I, I should be? And um, how can I kind of almost free myself from that that previous um, world, if you would? Um, and I think what I found one of the things that did really helps me is keeping your goals short term. I found that it's you know it's hard enough to get through today, let alone you know. So if you keep kind of focusing on what's out there and what's really you know, attainable, it help, helps a little bit. Yeah, because don't want okay. Um, I can contribute to that because I have a four-year-old who was two when I was diagnosed. She'll be five in a couple of weeks, but just. There's so many dreams, and I'm gonna cry because I always cry. But <laughs> there's so many dreams and hopes you have when you're expecting to do with your child. I can't do that now. <laughs> that is pretty understandable. So, as I can even say, it's just trying to take things day by day. So I try not to focus on what you know. I can't get with her. I can't ride bikes with her. But what I can do with her is. Sit down and read with her. Sit down and watch movies. Sit down and do crafts. I, you know, even though there's so many other physical things that I can't do that I dream of doing, I feel that we're so much closer because I have to be more involved in a more quiet, together setting. So that's what I just really try to focus on for. But it's been so hard. Again, I'm sorry. I'm it is hard because I think what you're doing is the right thing, doing other things with her. And I think that is what she needs. And riding a bike, anyone else can do it. Finding her the emotional support and to be her mom, you are the only one who can do it. No one else can take that role. Riding a bike, everyone can do it. Stand up, please. Stand up. Uh, I too could do everything before I hit 40. Scuba dive, snow ski, etc. Um, but uh, one of the things I've learned to try to live with this is I now live vicariously through my kids. Um, I've tried to pass on what I know because everything up here still works. It, this may not work, but this still does. So, you know, like my son, I sit there next to the car when I teach him how to change the brakes on the car, you know, how to change the oil, how to rotate the tires. There's not too many kids that could do that at 16 years old. Um, you know, he plays on the tennis team. I can't play tennis anymore. Besides, I was never very good anyway. <laughs> He's great, you know, so I think that's what we can do is we can pass on our experiences and our knowledge and let them run with it. You know, kind of hand the ball off to them and let them run. You know, because we can't carry it anymore. Yeah, Crystal? Hello, we have to go to a flight. Don't want to speak real quick. Um, you know, I had hopes and dreams, <clears throat> excuse me, hopes and dreams like every mother does for their child. Um, and those dreams just over time change, of course, with complicated disease. And I tend to not, I am, a, I am an emotional person, especially when I see other people, but I guess um, related to the Pompeii disease, I haven't been as emotional with her because I think I spend so much more time figuring out what can we do with her. Um, yeah, I get upset she's not out there playing a baseball like her sister does and things like that, but I think we stay so busy doing the things that she can do um, 
you know, even in her chairs and things like that, taking her and doing the things with her so that she has that kind of life, bringing her to Texas, you know, things that um, whether she can walk or not, we are going to try to do for her. Um, I guess my hopes for the future, you know, of course, I want her to be able to walk and figure out, you know, all this muscle regeneration and stem, th stem cell and all that, you know, how can we get these muscles working and that's for the adults and everybody. We want to fix what's already broken, you know, and try to improve everybody's life. But, you know, it's just taking day by day and deciding what we can do now um, to live our life to the fullest versus always saying, gosh, we can't do that, we can't do that. And that's, you're going to get depressed and negative all the time and everybody's going to see that. So it's just mainly staying positive. I fully agree with you, Chris. So it's really true. I, like you, I also, when I was a kid, I had many problems, but my mother was always able, and you were a mother too, so you're in the same role, focus on the things I could do, and, and that helped me a lot, because I could see, well, I do a lot of other things other children didn't do with their parents. So you have to be creative, I think, in a way, and give, in that way, uh, emotional support and development for your children. I think that, in me, it helped. And you know, just as a mother uh, myself, it's easy to focus on those things that you can't do. It's when you do have to look at what can I do with my child? Because your child, your children are the most important thing I know in everyone's lives, as my children are in my life. Um, and if you, I think if you just keep focusing on what can we do together, what can we do that's special that we can all do as a family and do something unique and focus on that. And it'll be more positive every day. Alicia? Um, you know, unfortunately, Tom came wrong. The opportunity as well. I mean, I have children. But with that note, I'm going to be the best bleak, bleak, bleak auntie in the world. Okay? So I have a little nephew, Tanner. He's six years old. And he knows I can't bend down. He thinks it was from a spider bite. As you know, honey, my legs are sick. Um, my other nephew was trying to play ball with him. He says, but auntie, we should just bend down like this. I said, yeah, that's about as far as I can go. So with that, I go to the movies with the boys, have more intimate, quality times. But yeah, it's tough that um, when I grew up, I was a Japanese equestrian, and I want to project that to the boys. But for me to be around the horses now is not really good. You know, one little accident nudge, loving nudge from the horse is going to topple me. Um, so I miss being able to pass that along. But I can still pass the knowledge and have instruct him what to do when he gets a little bigger, if he is interested in horseback riding, or the drive. One of my favorite pastimes, and even despite my breathing disability, is we blow bubbles, which is great exercise for me. And uh, that's fun too. So being creative, writing, reading, all that good stuff. So you just have to find those, the positive in life and not get bummed out. Can I, can I switch the topic a little? Yeah, one, one moment, someone. Okay. Yeah, um, just to kind of expand on what you were saying about looking for the, the good things, the things you can do. Uh, for about a year and a half, I worked at a physical therapy clinic that I was going to, and they hired me to, because I, I like to talk to the patients. And this particular clinic had a lot of neuromuscular patients, strokes, spinal cord injuries. And, and I, I would get frustrated because I had difficulty getting up, but then you turn and see that the person in, in, in the wheelchair would think, you know, I, I, I can walk, you know, or the, the, the quadriplegic that, that basically can't do anything for themselves, said they would kill to be in my position. So, again, like you said, look at what you have, not what you've lost and try to hang on to everything that you can, that you, you do have. Thanks. Right. Yeah, can I 
I switch the topic? Real yeah, of course. I was um, curious about how. Yeah, only send up when it's possible. Curious about um, for the question for those people that are working. My old job, I was very reluctant to uh, tell management and folks I had the disease because we were in a downsizing mode. And I figured, you know, that's a that's a big target. New jobs, it's fine. But I'm still a little, little reluctant to be open with people. I have to find immediate boss. I'm, I'm interested if those folks that are working you know, 40 hours, if um, if you've disclosed, you know, your, your condition, and if um, it's been a positive experience in terms of how your company's kind of responded to that. Same for me, I do work, I work almost 40 to 60 hours a week, and I was very fortunate that when I started um, on bots, I fully disclosed that I was going to be out a day every other every two weeks. And the type of work I do with the county has always been difficult. I've always had to work long hours the night before my infusion to be able to make up for the day I was off. And my employer has been excellent. They fully ergonomically gave me a nice share, set me up so I wouldn't have that much pain. And it's amazing how much my coworkers, they support me. There's things that they see me doing and they say, oh, you shouldn't be doing that. Because I try to do everything I can, but all my files I try to keep up everything on the top two drawers, never put anything in the lower drawers, but sometimes it's stuff that you don't use that often, you put in the lower drawers. And anytime they see me open that lower drawer, they always come up to help me. And it's amazing how they keep track of what my infusions are. Sometimes they miss the weeks, and, or that sometimes I change it to a Wednesday instead of a Tuesday, and uh, everybody knows it as my juice day. So if I book my infusion, they always know it as that Diana's going for her juice. And uh, it's just, it's just amazing, and the support of my company is just really fantastic as far as supporting me. I had a very different experience. I worked 40 hours a week for a company that supports the Army. I had to fight to get automatic doors put on the building. I had to argue about having more handicapped spaces put in the parking lot. I had to argue about unlocking the elevators. Um, I had to do a lot of research. What does the company allow? What is the American Disabilities Act? What do they require of these companies? You have to know what your rights are, and then you can go forward a little bit. I'm unlucky I have managers that support my time out for infusions and things, but I also knew what they had to do and what the building owners had to do and the property managers had to do. So that I had a little bit to argue and a little bit to push. Um, and so far, I haven't had a lot of pushback. But you know, it, it was not uh, a simple thing. And I also found I didn't tell people in my office except for like one person, and then everybody knew. <laughs> so it wasn't even my decision. At back, uh, Andrea. Well, I sort of uh, came out of the closet, if you would, um, a little bit more slowly. Um, I first realized that my first instinct was I didn't want anybody to know. Um, and people would say, oh, is something wrong with your leg? You look like you're limping. I say, oh, you know, I just do that, you know, just kind of put it off. But we had a fire drill. Uh, we actually had a, uh, it was almost a fire. and. I realized at that time that uh, I'm in management where I work and I have to take a lead role. And I realized that if I was asked to run around and close all the doors, I couldn't do that. And so I, I did tell my boss um, and he was very supportive. Um, as far as the infusions, that's actually been very easy. He said me, if I do enough work at my infusion, then I can count it as a work day and not as an off day. But I think the hardest part um, I did have a, I, the supervisors who worked for me. I did tell them because what I was able to do at work was um, a lot less than I had been. Where I used to jump in and, and help the people with the work. Um, this is in a hospital, so the kitchens and, and room cleaning is kind of two departments that I manage, um, and I couldn't do that anymore. So I, um, about a year ago, I a bit a year and a half. 
I decided it was time to basically go public with it. And it was very difficult, and I had a department meeting which everybody was required to attend for other reasons, but then um, I just basically told them. And it, interestingly enough, I, I think that there wasn't much reaction because I think a lot of people knew there was something wrong anyway. It, you know, I think people know there's something wrong sometimes before we realize it's visible. So it's, it, has, it hasn't been negative. It's actually been kind of freeing. And, there was a, a person that I run into once in a while at work who commented on my walking just recently. And usually I would, like I said, I would have just made some excuse. But this time I, I actually told him I have this disease, it's called positive death. And I had never actually done that before with somebody that, I could, not with people that I've been very close to, I've done it with total strangers, but not somebody who was kind of a casual acquaintance. And so I feel more confident to do that now. I'm sure it will open up your life, and people really are able to help you uh, when necessary. I worked full time up until June of last year when it just got to be too much. But before, two years prior to actually having to make the decision to stop working, um, and my work did wonderful things to help me. They got me a sit-stand desk so I could stand when I needed to, sit when I needed to. I have a lot of um, hip flexor pain and involved in uh, just a lot of back pain and sciatic and stuff that's in coordinates with everything. So my biggest deal with working is pain. I can't stay in one position for too long, but I can't stand for too long either. Um, but they got me sit-stand, they got me special chairs. Um, prior to diagnosis, I mean, my coworkers, we went, all went through the journey together. They knew what was going the whole time. So they rejoiced and, and cried with me when we finally got the diagnosis because you're glad you finally know what the heck's going on, but it's not really what you want to hear. But, and, but the one thing I would strongly recommend is get FMLA because it protects you. Virginia is a right to work state. We call it a right to fire state. They can fire you for no reason whatsoever. Even if you know that it's because you're disabled or you got pregnant or something, they can fire you, they don't have to have a reason, nothing. FMLA protects you. That was also a big thing in having to eventually stop working is my FMLA hours were gonna run out. And I just, even though they were really supportive, there was that underlying tone that once your FMLA hours are gone, we're gonna find a reason to let go of you. So, get FMLA, you can. It'll protect you, and but as for coworkers and everybody done, they seem to just really rally together. And and I had a fire drill incident too when I was supposed to have a buddy that was supposed to um, help me in the fire drill. <laughs> the fire drill went off. Nowhere to be found. <laughs> so luckily, it was just a practice drill. So. Fortunately, what? Lena? Um, <clears throat> this is just for parents. We did the same um, kind of struggles we went through with, you know, schools and everything with Trevor. But in our family, we have a real policy that we don't use the word can't. Um, as far as bike riding, we bike ride with Trev. He's in his wheelchair, but we bike. Uh, we uh, go golfing. We have a handicap uh, wheelchair accessible golf cart. Uh, this summer, Ty bought a pontoon boat. Trevor goes boating. Like, we try and make life as normal as possible and include all the family and friends that we can. Uh, we go camping, we travel. There's not a sporting event we haven't gone to. You can ask Trev. And uh, we do road trips, silly road trips, that we drive for two days to go to a baseball game or a football game. Like. Just because you have Pompeii disease doesn't mean you can't. You can do anything that you choose to do. Thank you, Linda, for sparing you both said words. What I'm curious about, and that's just my, yeah, that is how I, what my first reaction was after that treatment came up, and as well, now I have to take care of my own future, even my old age pension, and many people laughed about it, but. For me, it was very essential because the treatment turned up upside down my whole life. 
it changed my huge perspective. And as you can see, I'm very, still very disabled. And um, I am worried about the future. What, uh, what with care? Because even in the Netherlands, there are uh, healthcare budget cuts, uh, care budget cuts, all cuts, cuts, cuts. And we know who are the victims that are we. And I'm really wondering how I need to go further with my life with all those cuts and a wonderful treatment, but still the fact that you are very dependent upon others. Even if people say, well, you are great, you do everything, this body is absolutely nothing. The spirit is good, but the body is really vulnerable, and people under it overestimate it a lot. I really have to keep on fighting. And so that, that is sometimes psychologically very heavy. Um, and I wonder how you are dealing with it. Do you have a solution? Do you think about it? Uh, yeah. I just wonder how you do it. Yeah, my name is Lerva. I'm from, well, I was diagnosed in New York in 91, and I moved from here in 2002. I've been going to Gainesville for, um, <coughs> to see the doctor. I haven't, I'm not, I'm not in any treatment. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about it, but it's not easy. It's very hard for me. I try my best to go to church every Sunday, and I have to be called to sit in the chair in the in chairs. I need help every time, every time I turn around, they have this lady who's helping me. And my doctor said I have to keep on going. You know, don't give up and I try my best. I do everything that I can do for myself. And with faith, I trust in God and I'm hoping that you know it's twenty years now since I was diagnosed with the pancreas disease. And so far, so good. I can't do as much as I would like to do, but I'm hanging in there. And hopefully, I will do a treatment and I will feel better and do a lot more than I'm doing right now. And I trust in God. That's all we have to do. Brian, I saw you nodding when I was uh, talking. I guess. Uh, it's hard. I, I, I perfectly understand what you're saying. Um, it's hard to relate, though. The treatment is so expensive that I mean, if you have insurance, at least with my revenue HMO, I mean, it kind of just flows through, you know? So it's almost like I don't pay anything. I just go and somebody's paying for it. And I, I guess my employer and um, an insurance company. So at one, at one end, it's kind of hard to get a grasp around that, but we are, I mean, in the U.S., obviously, our healthcare systems has, you know, as much challenges as Europe, so probably a lot, a lot more. So, I, yeah, I don't know, long term, who knows what's going to be happening. We've got, a, you know, huge economic issues, and I think you're probably right. We're probably not, we're probably down here on the totem pole. Um, but I guess I, I, I have trouble just even getting my arms around those issues. I'm, I'm more worried, I guess I try to look more worried, or try to focus more on how am I gonna get in the plane tomorrow to get back to my, yeah, and I think maybe in a way, mentally that helps a little bit, because you can't, it's hard for us to affect the bigger issues, I think the, the individual, obviously people working together can, but we're already so challenged that I just have found that if I just try to keep my mind on Tuesday and what I do Wednesday, and maybe mentally that, it's a little, a little easier. But don't you think sometimes, uh it feels sometimes that uh, the treatment is great. I don't want to challenge that, but that is that sometimes sometimes make it even more difficult because you have a longer future with this. I mean, I know I will become 80 now in this body. It's quite uh, challenging. And uh, how have you thought about that? How how do you feel? I, I do feel that way sometimes. Um, obviously, I'm grateful for the treatment because mm -hmm. I'm not going to get progressively worse. Oh, that's good. And that my personal goal is to stay off a ventilator and out of a wheelchair parts, well, you know, full time, which is, is positive it's going to happen for me. Yes. Yeah. But 
I think, you know, when I'm 60, 70 years old, how am I going to feel if I already feel 60 or 70 years old now? Uh, you know, it's just like I can't imagine how, you know, that just old person weakness on top of Pompeii weakness, you know, how that's going to affect me. And, you know, and, and again, financially, I'm worried. When I stopped working, tried to get disability, had to cash out my 401. And then you have to worry about, insur you know, the insurances. We're all worried about, you know, what's going to happen with universal health care, the private insurance companies. We just don't know, and and like like Wilma, I just gotta trust that God has a plan, and that's what I. Yeah, it, my diagnosis really brought me back. I grew up in the church, but it really brought me back to seek out a church family, and that does help me cope. Is knowing that um, that there's a plan for me. I don't know what it is, but it, there is. So. <coughs> Well, um, I am that 62-year-old. <laughs> and I will tell you, I can sit and watch kids on their bicycles, and my mind says, you did that. Why can't you still do that? And then I realize why I can't. But I'll go up and I'll tell a young child, or I'll teach somebody. Um, I have changed my hobbies. Instead of going out and like you said, scuba dive and things like that, I, I, I used to do that. I can't do that anymore, but I can teach. And so now I'm doing a lot more sewing and quilting and I'm I'm teaching that, and it's funny. There was a saying, those who can't do, teach. Well, those who could do, teach. I could do some of that stuff, but now I, I, I'm just unable. I won't say can't. I'm unable to, but I can still teach. And you'd be surprised. I've taught my future son-in-law how to change the spark plugs, <laughs> and I've also told, shown him how to sheet rock. So those are things I could do, but now physically, it's it's just not there anymore. But if you can teach, it's like he told my daughter, your mom really knew what she was talking about. <laughs> Duh, you know. <laughs> My father taught me all that stuff. And and so you can teach and you can see if in the next generation they'll pick it up. You'd be surprised how many parents have to work. Two both parents. And they didn't have the advantages we had of one parent being able to teach us stuff. So you've got to step in, be able to teach you know, to the younger generation. I've been hesitant to take the microphone because once I get started, I might not stop. I might take the microphone away from me. I'm another one of the 60 year olds. Um, I was diagnosed with Pompeii so, uh, about 40 years ago, uh, something around a while. Um, you know, in retrospect, uh, uh, the onset was actually before then. Um, I was on active duty uh, Army, I was active duty Army when I was, uh, had to make the onset. Uh, so I had an advantage there in military medicine. Um, I consider myself alive today because of military medicine. I haven't had to worry about the insurance problems and everything. Uh, uh, when I had the major onset, I was teaching clinical chemistry uh, here at Fort St. Easton at the Wabasini Academy of Health Sciences. It's now the AMED school. Uh, so I also had that advantage of medical background and spoke the same language as the doctors. <laughs> That was a major advantage. Uh, most of the doctors already knew me. Uh, 
the long story about that. <laughs> Don't want to take the time. Um, it did take a while to adjust to the fact that I couldn't do what I used to do. Uh, I went through a period where I was depressed. Um, but I also uh, had the hobby of photography. I was actually, uh, I've been a freelance photographer since uh, uh, I started in college back in the 60s. So I, I, I had that to kind of fall back on and uh, ended up uh, teaching photography at one of the local universities. Uh, I just retired at the end of the last school year. Um, teaching is uh, at the university is generally a little bit more flexible than a lot of other jobs. Uh, very easy to adapt. I could sit down and give the lectures and presentations. Um, um, they were very flexible. Uh, uh, was adapting to, to what I needed to do uh, to keep working and keep teaching. Uh, I just retired uh, at the end of the last school year in May. And I'll tell you, if you ever reach, uh, if you're still working and you reach retirement age, you might think twice. I'm, I'm beginning to think I need to go back to, to teaching to, to get some rest because I haven't, I don't feel like I've sat down since. Uh, um, the, the, the main point I want to make is, um, in a way, it is a, a you know, it's a downer, but it also has a great opportunity. I, I'm, I'm a parent of two, grandparent of four. Uh, I had the advantage of being at home with the children where a lot of fathers aren't. Uh, more time than most fathers are. Uh, it's a teaching schedule and everything. Uh, so I, I, I really enjoyed that. Um, it's, it's a matter of finding, uh, finding what you love and pursuing it. Uh, my, one of my loves is photography, and one of the things that has kept me going since I retired, I knew I'd have to find something after I retired uh, to keep myself socially connected and uh, physically active enough to, to maintain the condition, the, um, what condition I have. Uh, I can walk, I use the forearm crutches. Uh, I, I love walking, uh, I get tired fairly quickly, um, but I can walk about a mile or two, three days a week. Uh, get probably about a half mile an hour. <laughs> uh, so I go out on nature walks uh, three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday morning. Um, uh, that's what I love. And I've got a website set up where my photographs appear and has helped me kind of keep socially connected. Uh, so uh, my advice is, uh, you know, find what you really love. Uh, this is your opportunity to, to follow, uh, follow where your heart leads. Thank you. Can I make a suggestion? Can we all say our name and where we're from when we stand up? That's oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I just have a question for the gentleman that was just speaking. Um, I'm Lolita, I'm from Buffalo, New York. My mom is actually uh, has Pompeii. So I just wanted to know how long, if have, do you, are you receiving any treatment and for how long now? Because No, uh, no I'm not on a treatment program. Uh, uh, I'm still followed in the military medical system, which is uh, completely distinct from the civilian system. I could be on treatment. Uh, I was not within the military system. But because of some other medical problems I have, uh, uh, they were concerned about my starting the, uh, the treatment. It might happen down the line here, but no, I'm not. I haven't been on the treatment. I stepped out, so I may have missed something, but uh, Don uh, was one of the first people that we ever met, and actually Dr. Sloan based his diet and exercise therapy on Don. Don had a regimen that he had developed with his military doctor. 
So this is the first person we ever heard anything about this from. And he helped us personally because uh, Tiffany was 58 pounds, I think, and uh, she couldn't sustain that high protein, so he suggested high fat, which we did. And Tiffany now says, we went too far. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to say sitting down. I can only stand up and sit down so many times. Uh, uh, as Marilyn said, uh, uh, I was one of the first, I uh, was the first patient that the uh, treatment of the was diagnosed. Uh, the um, military doctors were great. Uh, uh, the, usually I end up with the chief of staff of the department. Uh, and the, um, it was the chief of staff at uh, neurology at Bamsey that, that I was working with. And he did, uh, I had some tests done, a pulmonary function and another test done. And I went into the appointment and he said, uh, either you're going on a ventilator or we're going to try some experimental therapy. And I said, well, what do we have to lose? Let's go to work. Uh, and that's when we started. Uh, he put me on a ephedrine, which you can't get anymore. Uh, and uh, that's when we started experimenting with diet and exercise. And um, actually, over the long term, it was the exercise uh, program that I think did more than the ephedrine and, and diet did. Uh, going back to Linda's presentation yesterday, uh, I, I think the, the exercise program is, is just absolutely critical. Uh, it has to be adjusted for your own ability, your own level. Uh, but I think it's one of the keys to, to uh, staying functional in addition to the, the enzyme replacement therapy. Thank you. Uh, I guess uh, growing up through life, I was able to walk and I played t-ball and baseball and all of that stuff. And then it progressively got worse as time went on. And so I knew somewhere down the line I wasn't going to be able to play hockey like I wanted to. So it changed my motivation. Instead of me playing hockey, I'm going to be the best darn hockey watcher in all of Canada. <laughs> so, so I guess uh, basically, what you're unable to do physically wise, you can still find a way to do it in other ways than just physical. You can you can still watch, you can you can do anything you set your mind to. And I guess don't let this disease limit you. And what my mom said, don't use the word can't. That's that's not my vocabulary. That's not my dictionary. I I can do anything, even though I have heart disease. Thank you. Uh, I think this is just a wonderful account. I think uh, I can't add and I can't and. I can't add any more, anything more to it. So sometimes can't is allowed, by the way. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think we also reached our time to Tiffany. Yeah. But before we end, I heard these great, yeah, yeah, great people. That I, I, I think I'm allowed to say that. Some feel like friends. And um, I want to ask you something. Uh, the International Pump Association is collecting testimonials. I'm collecting it for the IBA. Please, if you want to contribute to that, we would love to have your testimonial on what pump disease means to you, what the treatment does to you, how you live your life, everything we can learn from. Because we learned that these testimonials are, these testimonials are important for everyone, not just the US, but all around the world. People waiting for treatment, wanting to learn from you. I think we can learn from each other, even if you are on treatment, 
you can read each other's stories <coughs> and relate to it, learn new things. So if you want to uh, participate, please come to me and let me know and I'm happy to reach out when I have arrived back in the Netherlands on Wednesday. So thank you very much for everything you did here. I, I, to be honest, I'm really impressed with all the people contributing to this uh, discussion. It's really inspiring and very good. Thank you. Thank you, Marissa, for leading this session. <coughs> So I have to make just one announcement. So the Pomba community is so strong. So I think some of, some one of you is uh, uh, somebody may not be aware of it, but it's such a strong community, and this community is making things happen outside the Pomba community. So as far as, as I can see from from the German and the European standpoint, um, so there are communities forming in the in the GSD Type Five, the Gardel. So there are activities starting, so they have seen what, what happened in the, in the, in the public community, in the IPA, and they start similar things. And even in the um, GSD Type 1 and Type 3, there are things happening, there's community forming. And that's the reason why we want to, we want to try to bring these communities together so that they can learn from, from each other. So we're planning to have a next conference in 2013 in Heidelberg, Germany, and it will bring together the, the muscle the muscle types two and three, uh, two and five, sorry, and um, there will be parallel sessions for type one and type three. So it's still a concept, so I have no, no, no program on hand, so I can show it. But this will happen, and we will have plenary sessions for all um, for, for all types, and you're invited to bring in your perspective even in the planning. So stay tuned to the to the IPA website, to, to GSDNet. Um, I will get you informed, and uh, I hope it will be a great conference. So Brian is thinking back to 2003. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the first conference in Heidelberg. It was a big success, and I think we uh, will try to, to top it in, in, in two years. I'd like to make a comment on that. Um, I've been on the GSD net for quite some time now, and I'm today I'm realizing there are people and faces and names that I don't know yet. So, Tiffany or Marsha, I hate to give you this workload, but could you please email them and request the link to sign up to the GSD net? It's a worldwide chat group. Um, I would suggest if you don't want all the different types, just say that you want all type two information and you will hear our daily chatter. There's not a lot, don't worry. It's not like Facebook, it's a little quieter, but um, a lot of the doctors are listening. They may not be able to comment, but I know Tiffany listens, Marsha listens. So if you have a question that you or a challenge you're facing that day, go ahead and throw it out there. You will get replies. And again, it's worldwide. So please sign up to the GSD net. Thank you. Sorry, Tim. Yeah. And, and I wanted to just say that we have Kevin O'Donnell to thank for that. Yes. He started early or mid uh, 1990s. And he stays in the background, but Kevin's there. He's the one that gave the presentation about the uh, history of Pompeii's disease. Uh, yes, if anybody's interested in joining the GSD net, just send me or Marcia an email and we'll get you the link you need. Um, and on that note, I want to thank Marissa again for doing such a wonderful job of hosting this session and for all of you for participating in it and sharing your stories. I think it helps all of us when we come together and share our stories. And on that note, um, the conference is now closed. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I think we have one more comment. Not quite close. Yeah. <laughs> I tried. As uh, chair of the 
chair in, in, the, in Europe is the same as president, I guess. So. As chair of the International Pompey Association, it's my duty and absolute pleasure to thank um, Tiffany. And we're all intensely grateful that, that the program was incredible from um, reminding us all of the important history of how we got here, the, um, the, the present benefits and, and how the ERT is going to be improved in the near future, we hope, and gene therapy in the future. Lots of things to look forward to, giving us all hope for uh, improved outcomes. So, Tiffany, on behalf of the whole Pompey community, I don't know if you can help this, but thank you very much. One other thing was that, of course, apart from organising this, Tiffany organised a day of meetings for the International Pompey Association on Friday. And um, as you know, I was off enjoying myself in the Alps and not having very much to do. So, in recognition of all the effort that Tiffany's put in, in, in on behalf of the IPA, she's been voted unanimously as vice president of the IPA. So she shares a lot of my responsibilities now. So. <laughs> Really pleased with that. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Alan, and you have the secret out, but okay, good. Um, and now the conference is officially closed. <laughs> Thank you all for coming.